In the far distant future, a powerful alien race spreads its influence throughout the stars, conquering and subjugating all those that they encounter. Now they stand poised to strike at the heart of humanity, at the Earth itself. The only choice left is to defeat them before they have the chance, and to finally liberate all of the worlds that they have ruthlessly enslaved. Fallen Haven Liberation Day is a turn-based strategy game. In it, you play as a military commander sent to a distant world and human colony with the goal of liberating it after it was conquered by aliens. The campaign of the game is played on a series of large, interconnected islands. Each of these islands is divided into a number of sectors, with the sectors themselves representing the individual missions that you can take on. You can often choose between multiple missions at the same time, and once you've cleared all the sectors on an island, you'll be able to assault the enemy headquarters and then move on to the next area. The gameplay is a mixture of turn-based combat and base management. Each time you arrive on a new island, you'll need to set up a headquarters for your troops. You'll start with a basic command post and then use roads to connect it to other structures such as a barracks, a supply post, or a satellite uplink. Each of these buildings has a cost, and the order you construct them in is important, as each one can unlock new weapons, materials, or even unit types for use in combat. You'll also want to protect your base with defensive emplacements as well, things such as guard towers, barricades, or even landmines. Completing missions will reward you with resources, and in between battles you'll be able to return to your base and continue expanding it. Once you've finished setting up your headquarters, you can move to the campaign map and select a mission. Most of them will require you to attack an enemy base or eliminate a certain number of units. However, there are also special missions that require you to defend or reach specific locations on the map or eliminate a specific target within a given amount of time. At the beginning of combat, you'll have the opportunity to place your troops in specific deployment zones around the edge of the battlefield. Each type of troop that you can deploy costs a certain amount of resources, and you're free to mix and match between cheap infantry and more expensive vehicles as you see fit. Once the battle actually starts, you'll actually generate a small number of points each turn, which you can use to buy more units to reinforce your troops. Just keep in mind that units become more expensive the longer the battle goes on. You also have the option of saving your points and use them to buy more powerful support actions, such as airstrikes or reinforcement drops, which you can call in anywhere on the battlefield. As mentioned before, all the battles in Liberation Day take place in turn-based combat. At the start of your turn, each of your units is given a number of action points. They can then spend these action points either moving around the map or attacking the enemy. Any unit can be moved in any order, and you can alternate between your troops as you see fit. If your units have any action points remaining at the end of their turn, they can enter Overwatch and potentially fire on incoming enemies. If you manage to eliminate all of the enemy forces or complete your objectives, the mission will be complete. However, some missions will also allow you to complete side objectives by capturing enemy research centers. Having a unit stationed next to these buildings at the end of combat will allow you to capture them and gain valuable research points, which you can use in between battles to upgrade your troops, improving their effectiveness. Once you complete all the missions on a campaign map, you'll move to a new island, which will unlock new structures, defensive, and units for your army. So what's the good and bad of Liberation Day? 
Well, for starters, the game has a really strong strategic core. The action point system is very simple but effective, allowing you to divide up your troops' movement and attacking as you see fit. On top of that, you have a really wide selection of units at your disposal. Everything from infantry and grenadiers up through tanks and even helicopters and submarines, all of which have different strengths and weaknesses depending upon the situation. And in addition to that, the reinforcement system gives you a lot of tactical flexibility. The capacity to call in reinforcements mid-combat or use support abilities to soften up the enemy opposition is a fantastic advantage. The addition of management elements with your base also gives the campaign some strategic depth. Do you take an easy mission knowing that you won't get very many resources out of it, or do you take a harder mission knowing that if you win, you'll be able to upgrade your base and unlock new units? As for the presentation, there are somewhat mixed results. Visually, the game looks pretty good at first glance. All of your units are individually modeled with their own sprites and weapon effects. And it's the same for the enemy as well as special abilities like airstrikes. The maps also have a strong variety between different forests and mountains and arctic and coastal regions. And they even have some special terrain effects where enemy buildings are destructible and map tiles such as forests or barricades can be destroyed so that you can bypass them. At the same time, this system creates a lot of visual clutter. It can be hard to pick out enemy and even sometimes your own troops in between all the exploded and deformed terrain. There are times when it will actually be harder to see your infantry standing next to a forest than the infantry units that are standing directly in the forest itself. And there's not really a good solution for this. This game, like many of its contemporaries, was just a victim of the resolution available at its time. The audio of the game is also pretty mixed as well. As far as sound effects go, the, the samples used for movement and unit attacking are all pretty basic and repetitive. And yet, despite that, the music of the game is actually surprisingly good. The game only has a handful of tracks, but they're all unexpectedly memorable. Now, as for downsides, the game has two big flaws, which drag down what should have been an otherwise excellent strategy experience. The first is pretty general, in that the game doesn't provide you with good information. The interface by itself is okay. You can see your units, you can see the tactical map, you can see the mini-map. Occasionally it is hard to find your troops, as I mentioned before, but that's not always the case. The problem here is that it's not easy to get good, detailed information about units on the field. Right-clicking on a unit will show you their hit points, their action points, and their range, and that's it. Other information, pertinent information, such as their damage, their rate of fire, their minimum range, their area of effect, none of that is displayed. The only way to get that information is to go into the game's encyclopedia and look up the specific entry for that unit itself. And even if you were to memorize that entry, it wouldn't be helpful. As mentioned before, units can upgrade as a campaign progresses, which means that their statistics can change as the game goes on. And even then, you're not getting complete information, because most units have special abilities, but these special abilities are only represented by icons next to the unit, and the game doesn't tell you what these icons mean. You have to go into the manual in order to figure that out. And this general lack of information can be best summarized with weapon accuracy, which is a feature never once mentioned in the actual game. 
Essentially, what this is, is that as you are playing the game, you may notice occasionally that your units, when firing their weapons, do not hit their target. They hit one of the spaces next to their target instead. Now, admittedly, this can be hilarious when you or your enemy goes to attack and winds up blasting one of your own troops out of existence. But what makes it so annoying is that the game never tells you why this is happening. You could almost think that it's a bug. The game only mentions it in one line in the manual under the firing weapons section as, I quote, Note, there is always a chance of missing a target. So, weapon accuracy is a thing, but that's all the information you get. You'll never know the percentages, you'll never know the effects, you'll never know the modifiers. I'm not even sure that it's a static variable, since there's a special ability that supposedly reduces enemy overwatch accuracy, but again, I only knew about that because of an entry in the manual, and not the game itself. So, so you wind up with this random element that affects all of the game's combat, and you just have no details about it, which is not great design. Now, weapon accuracy, while frustrating, affects your enemy as much as it affects you, which means that you can kind of learn to live with it. That being said, the second flaw of Liberation Day is more specific to the campaign, and yet it's so aggressively tedious that it wound up becoming the primary reason why I stopped playing the game. Now, if you remember before, I mentioned how when setting up your headquarters, you'll want to place defensive structures, and that's because at certain points in the campaign, the enemy will counterattack you and assault your base. When this happens, the strategy shifts to a defensive operation as the aliens try and destroy your structures while you try to protect them. Now, the first couple of times this happens, it's pretty entertaining. It changes the objectives and gives you an opportunity to test out your base building skills. The third and fourth time, well, it gets a little repetitive. Your enemy doesn't have as an adaptive an AI as it needs to to be able to assault all the different base combinations that you, the player, are capable of coming up with. And then by the fifth time and the sixth time and so on, it just becomes unbearable. Especially when you get to the third island and the enemy just starts counterattacking you after almost every other mission, these battles become beyond repetitive. Especially considering that at a certain point, they're not even challenging anymore. If you've gotten to the point where you build your base with any efficiency in mind, the computer will have no response. Chances are, you'll have so many resources at your disposal, you'll be able to set up a line of main battle tanks and then just sit back and watch as the opponent just walks in front of their cannons. And yet, as the campaign continues, these counterattacks just keep increasing in frequency, to the point where they drag the game into a virtual standstill. In the end, Fallen Haven, Liberation Day is kind of a disappointment. It has a really strong strategic core. The variety of units that you have at your disposal, as well as the slowly changing battlefield, mean that there are a lot of great opportunities for exciting turn-based combat. At the same time, the lack of quality information and the repetitive single-player campaign are a real drag on what should be a much smoother and more dynamic experience. I would give the game 2 out of 4 stars, but I would only recommend it to the most hardcore fans of turn-based strategy. It does have skirmish and multiplayer modes if the campaign gets to be too much, and there is that soundtrack as well, which is definitely worth at least a listen. Alright, well, thanks for watching. Till next time, I'll see you then.